I'm Prof. Ahmed Abu I am a consultant and professor of nursing King Saudi University. I'm a board member of Saudi Nursing Association. We're going to use SNA uh, referring to Saudi uh, Nurses Association. So, uh, on behalf of Saudi Nurses Association, I would like to welcome you all and say thank you for being here tonight to attend uh, uh, this webinar. First of all, I would like to say thank you. Uh, to the Continuous Professional Department, CBD uh, Affairs and Scientific Association Department at Saudi Commission for Health Specialists for their support and help for making this webinar uh, alive and going. So thank you for the groups. Thank you, Ghada, Mohammed, Sharifa, and the rest of the team. You did a great job, really, for having this, uh, this webinar. Uh, secondly, I'd like uh, to, to talk to you about the Saudi Nursing Association and our plan in, 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 as a scientific and, and continuous education. So we're going to have we're going to have a series of webinars. So our plan uh, at SNA will have weekly meeting a webinar. So please join us uh, and provide us with the topic which you are interested. And also, on the other hand, we would like to to hear from you. We would like to some to have a presenter from you. So if you are interested, you can visit us in Twitter, in our website, and there is a form for, uh, to be an speaker. And all of you are welcome to join us. Uh, also, I would like to, uh, to utilize this opportunity to encourage you to be a member in the Saudi uh, Nursing uh, Nurse Association. Uh, and there is an deal now uh, because of the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis, we have an, uh, 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 a discount. So please use discount and hopefully uh, uh, you, you will get it. Finally, uh, this work won't, ha uh, won't happen without support of the president of the association and the board members of SNA. So thank you so much for everybody. Thank you, Brahim Bilharith. Rahim is the in charge of the uh, of the media and marketing, and public relation. Also, thank you, Zuhu. Thank you for the rest of the board for their for their help. I'd like to say thank you for Abir Al Harthi and Khulud Al uh, from College of Nursing at KSU for their help, and and they will be our our uh, our speaker soon, maybe in next week or a week after. Uh, before I turn the floor to our speaker. I'd like to say thank you, Zainab, for accepting our invitation and being our speaker uh, uh, tonight. Uh, Zainab al Mohor is a uh, master holder, and uh, uh, she has a bachelor degree from the Miami University before, uh, and she got a master uh, a master of uh, nurse practitioner from California, San Francisco. She got a 14 years experience uh, as an um, emergency and trauma uh, uh, nurse. Currently, she's working as an emergency clinical nurse specialist at John Hopkins uh, uh, Aramco Healthcare System. Uh, our guests, please feel free to, uh, to ask a question by using the, the Q&A uh, option down in the screen. So we will answer your question by the end of, uh, of this lecture. Uh, so, Zainab, uh, the floor is yours. So, go ahead and good luck. Okay, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Ahmed uh, Abushaiga, for your introduction and welcome. I hope everybody can hear me very well. Yes, we do. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the Saudi Nurses Association for coming up with this initiative to coordinate such fantastic learning events. And thank you to everyone who have registered and joined us this evening. I usually like to begin any presentation by explaining the reasoning behind choosing a certain topic. Um, is my video available online? Uh, not, not yet. 
So as I said, I usually like to begin any presentation by explaining the reasoning behind choosing a certain topic. And since pandemics will continue to challenge clinicians, policymakers, public health leaders, they are unexpected and unavoidable events. They are characterized by their uncertain scope, duration, and impact. In light of the current COVID-19 pandemic, we have, heard, we have heard and seen nurses being in the front line taking care of patients. But what about the nurses' role in emergency preparedness? Nurses are experts in, um, in patient care and coordination, and they have the first-hand knowledge uh, of the essential needs during any large Im impact emergency. Nurses should not just be the executors of a surge capacity plan, but they need to be among its development team. As surge capacity becomes a greater focus of discussion and research, especially in the realm of disaster and pandemic planning, um, I feel that it's crucial for nurses to understand this concept and its relevance to their practice. So this is why I decided to choose it as a topic. So this is just our disclosure disc declaration, have nothing to declare. Reading off our objectives of the screen, um, by the end of the session, we will be able to define search capacity. What does it mean? Identify why search capacity planning is essential understand the crucial steps that healthcare facilities can take to prepare for pandemic. We will explore the different staffing models that could be used during pandemic, and we will answer common pandemic-related dilemmas, such as when assets get short, how can we prioritize staffing, equipment, and bed utilization? I would like to spend a moment to compare pandemics to other major emergencies um, in order to understand the unique case of about pandemic preparedness. Generally speaking, we are more prepared for other types of emergencies such as fires, floods, or explosions, but not as much for pandemics. The first difference, um, you, typically with other emergencies such as um, fires or hurricanes, they tend to be temporary events where the surge of victims seeking healthcare is rapid, but it also ends fast. Whereas in the case of pandemics, they are extended events that go over months and years, and there will be overlapping of patients. Just like with this COVID-19 pandemic, when you consider the average length of stay for an ICU COVID-19 patients, which is between 13 to 21 days, we will start getting new patients before we are able to discharge our current caseload. So some systems might get overwhelmed. The second major difference is that other emergencies tend to be location specific with the human and financial loss specific to that location. And generally, other areas that are not affected with this emergencies will be able to send relief and assistance. In the case of pandemics, almost every country will be overwhelmed by their own caseload, so they will not be able or unlikely to be able to send relief or assistance, leaving areas that are hard hit with COVID-19 um, or any pandemic are left to suffer on their own. Finally, with other types of emergencies, healthcare providers don't make the majority of your victim, there will be a small percentage of your victims list. In the case of pandemics, staff will be largely affected to, due to exposure and transmission risk. So what is surge capacity? So many definitions. I will share two that I feel explains it very well. The first one is from the American College of Emergency Physician. Uh, which I will just read off the screen, a measurable representation of the healthcare organization's ability to manage a sudden influx of patients. It is dependent on a well-functioning incident management system and the variables of space, supplies, staff, and any special considerations. Another 
Another definition that explains surge capacity, but, but in much simpler terms, is, another, is the definition from the American Nurses Association, which again, I'm going to read off the screen, is the ability to obtain adequate staff, supplies, and equipment, structures, and systems to provide sufficient care to meet immediate needs of an influx of patients following a large-scale incident or a disaster. To explain surge capacity planning further, I would like to discuss another buzzword that has all has been trending in social media, and you have probably heard it or seen it somewhere, flatten the curve. What does it mean to flatten the curve? If you look, excuse me, if you look on the graph on the screen, the graph on the left-hand side is the number of positive cases that will increase from the time of the first identified case of COVID-19 if no control measures have been implemented. These control measures are dependent on government decisions and um, government decisions and community support, which is something that the government of Saudi Arabia with the coordination of the Ministry of Health have been doing fantastically since the beginning of this crisis. Controls like closing the borders, quarantine, uh, installing curfews, closing schools and shopping areas, the robust case and contact tracing, um, even the crackdown on areas with questionable overcrowding and sanitation. All these control measures have controlled the transmission and have slowed the spread in order for us, the healthcare providers or the healthcare system to be able to raise the line. And this is the line that I, that I mean, which I'm pointing at, at the screen. This line represents our conventional capacity or our day-to-day -day capacity and resources with time, which could be as few as few days, as little as few days, we can do the following. We can get more ventilators. We can open more isolation units. We can procure PPE. We can integrate telemedicine, expand our testing capacity. We can train our nurses. We can learn from people in hot, who are currently in their hotspots. Our focus of the webinar today will be on raising this line in order to accommodate for the increasing influx of patients. Search capacity can be local on the level of a healthcare organization. It could be regional, just like the coordinated effect, um, efforts by the different health systems within the same health cluster in Saudi Arabia. It could be done on a national level, which is what the Ministry of Health is doing with um, with the government, and it could be global, just like what is being coordinated between the Gulf countries and the coordination done by the World Health Organization. Healthcare facilities um, plans should maximize the conventional capacity, which is the day-to-day -day regular operations and resources, as well as plan for contingency capacity, which means adapting patient care spaces and resources to provide functional Yes. Yes. Sure. Let's try again. Do you hear me? Yes, it's good now, yes. Okay. So as I as I said, we need to, uh, healthcare facilities need to maximize their conventional capacity, which is the day-to-day -day regular operations and resources, as well as plan for contingency capacity, which means adapting patient care and resources to provide the same care that we do on a conventional level, but with lim more with less resources. With the crisis capacity, is adapting to the level of care provided and the resources available when the usual care is impossible. So why is surge capacity planning essential? Because effective response is dependent on adequate preparation. It allows the organizations an opportunity to address key safety issues before they become critical. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay now. Okay. And to highlight the importance of uh, preparation and addressing identified critical issues, we can look at how some Asian countries uh, like Singapore and South Korea have been successful in their response to COVID-19. 
because a lot of Asian countries have experienced the devastation, the devastating impact of the SARS epidemic in 2003, they have learned to do better. Not only their government systems have implemented critical controls and their community have supported them by adhering to them, but even the healthcare facilities have implemented their own measures to be ready. I remember attending a webinar from a few weeks back where they had a guest from Singapore who stated that the Ministry of Health in Singapore mandates that healthcare facilities stockpile PPE and essential equipment to last for four to six months for a patient influx up to 100% of their conventional patient, patient load. And they need to have a backup plan once they, once they start using from that stock. On the other hand, healthcare systems in countries that have been hard hit with COVID-19, such as the US, Italy, and France, have had access to sophisticated software that estimates how long staffing, equipment, supplies, and other resources will last prior to reaching failing level. What was shocking that a majority of the, of the large health care systems in those uh, countries will start failing within 13 days of an emergency event. And this is what we can see happening with this COVID-19 pandemic. Also, surge capacity planning is essential because it will enhance your staff readiness and resilience. Being prepared can alleviate healthcare staff and anxiety and stress, increase their morale, and will reduce their burnout. There, so what are the components of an effective surge capacity plan? There are four major components, and for ease, we will divide them into the four S's, staff, stuff, space, and systems. And you can see a poll that that we have put up. Please vote. I will take just a few moments just to see the results. Which of the four S's do you believe is the most crucial? Staff, stuff, space, systems, or structure? Okay. So uh, if you look at the screen more about 50% of participants said staff and 35% said system and structure. I'm glad uh, that the majority agree with me with staffing being the most crucial component of the surge capacity plan. Everything else is replaceable. You can create a field hospital using a tent and a few mattresses. You can come up with creative ways to creative ways to uh, repurpose things like PPE and equipment and systems and policies will need to change to adapt to the, to the pandemic situation. But a safe, competent, efficient staff is irre irreplaceable and they are the component you will want to invest the majority of your resources to support. So what should healthcare facilities do to prepare Their staffing prior to the surge. First of all, healthcare organizations need to learn about their staff, who they are, what do they do, what are their skills, uh, how they are, do they have any restrictions that can affect their safety. Um, we need to answer the when, what is the length of their experience, when was their last fit test, when do their credentials expire. We want to create a comprehensive skill database for each discipline and it could be as simple as each unit does their own staff list individually, then utilizing somebody with data analysis experience to compile them into a comprehensive organization-wide list. And you want to divide that list to critical and non-critical. Critical will be your frontliners that you need to be at the hospital during times of crisis, and non-critical are the people who can offer support from distance or from home. In the slide, you can see an example of a simple staffing spreadsheet that has info about nurses and doctors from different areas, different ranks. Uh, really, it doesn't take more than this. You can see, for example, we have a senior nurse who works in the cardiac ICU with 18 years of experience, who has ACLS and critical care training, up to date with her fit test, have no restrictions, 
and has some um, transport uh, experience. At the same time, if you look at the physician list, you can find a resident who works in the emergency with two years of experience who have some ENT uh, previous experience. So you get the idea. So now, next you want to identify your current critical care frontliners, and they're typically going to be your emergency and ICU staff. Then you need to find a backup pool for your critical care, which will come from your acute care areas, such as the cath lab, step down, peri off, or high dependency unit. You want to include administrative staff with clinical background, a nursing manager or a nursing coordinator that worked previously in a clinical setting. Med surge and outpatient staff, technicians, assistants, nursing interns, students, and volunteers could be part of your backup pool. You want to create groups and teams and assign a team lead. After, once you have the list of critical staff members, you want to start training. The first step is infection control training for any direct patient care providers. And you want to do that as a refresher because infection control training should have been done at least quarterly, whether it's a pandemic situation or not. Um, staff need to demonstrate effective hand hygiene, proper sequence of donning and doffing PPE, the correct way to collect nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swabs. And you want to make staff familiar with any emerging info, such as the visual triage and epidemiology forms that the MOH have supplied us. Second, critical care training should take place for your backup pool. Keep in mind that you're not going to train a non-ICU or a non-ED nurse to become a critical care nurse overnight. This requires years and years of experience, but you want to conduct training that will help your nurses from your backup pool be able to support your critical care nurses and able to respond to emergency situations. For example, you would want to do micro BLS, ACLS, calcer refreshers. You want to go over the care algorithms of critical care patients, for example. I find that when you are pressed for time and you need to conduct training effectively and quickly, there is no better way than through simulations, case scenarios, and walkthroughs. Practice, practice, practice. Practice with your teams how you're going to respond when you have your first suspected case if you haven't yet. Simulate the situation where you need to take care of a number of critical patients at the same time and practice assigning tasks and prioritizing care. Practice how you are going to transport a patient from one area to another, for example, from the emergency department to an ICU. Practice triaging a busload of patients that walk into your facility at the same time. You want to practice and practice enough so when you have an actual situation, Staff don't panic. They will just repeat the steps that they have practiced previously. And you want to utilize, of course, online learning. N95 fit testing. You need to ensure that your staff have been fit tested if they are expected to take care of any suspected or confirmed cases. This should be done on a yearly basis with records of each staff, respirator number, and alternative. I have added another poll to see the percentage of people who have been recently fit tested. Let's take a look. Have you been fit tested in the past 12 months? Yes or no? Let's take a moment just to find out about the results. Okay, so 55% have been fit tested, 45% have not. I wonder why, and this is something that you need to go back to your organizations and uh, demand that you do. For staff who cannot use respirators, for example, because of facial, uh, facial hair, ensure that they have been trained to use powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs for short, um, and that they know how to put it on, how to take it off, power it, disinfect it, and store it. 
You want to share the surge capacity plan with all your staff. And to preserve staffing, you might consider cancellation and rescheduling of annual leaves. Moving on to non-critical staffing, these are your admin staff, your clerks, your accounting, your IT, et cetera. You want to identify that group of staff. You want to prepare them to work from home if possible. IT is very crucial here for tech support. They need to address accessibility issues and cybersecurity issues. Managers need to assign tasks and timelines. Also, this group of staff can be assigned to low-risk tasks, such as preparing PPE cards, preparing kits, preparing testing equipment, which anybody can do without a health care experience. Moving on to stuff. Stuff will include your PPE, which is your most critical. But also don't forget about things that are consumable, like your medication, your IV fluids, your IV access kits. Also, you need to check for your non-consumables, IV pumps, monitors, defibrillators, ventilators. You want to make sure that they are in good working order. And if pandemic-specific items, such as test kits, forms, and patient, need, patient materials uh, need to be ready. What you need to do, what healthcare, pro healthcare facilities need to do prior to surge in terms of preparing for stuff. You need, healthcare facilities need to look at their current supply inventory and estimate how long they're going to last. A plan should be developed to preserve current stocks. Uh, try to procure additional supplies and develop, develop a contingency plan in case you run out of stock. What are you going to do to get additional stock? And you want to communicate plan proactively with frontliners. Prior to search. In terms of space, you need to identify, healthcare organizations need to identify their current bed status. How many ED beds do we have? How many ICU beds? How many isolation areas do we have? And we need to create new capacity beds, either by opening new isolation wards or expanding our ED and ICU spaces. Also, healthcare organizations need to think and plan for alternative care sites, such as field hospitals, like those set up by some health systems in areas with severe community spread. One of the things that were implemented at Johns Hopkins around Poe Healthcare, where I work, is establishing a drive-through testing where patients would phone in with their information, they would be given a slot to drive through a designated area where a nurse in full PPE would take their swab and patients would be given instructions on home quarantine, isolation, and home care. Also, the MOH have created COVID-19 clinics in some primary care centers. In primary care centers uh, where patients can come in with in pre-assigned slots to be tested and given outpatient care prior to the decision of them going back home for home isolation, transferring them to a quarantine center, or taking them to a hospital for admission. Also, you need to consider areas for PPE donning and docking to minimize any chance of cross-contamination and infection control protocol breaches. And that is for your patient care areas. We also need to take a look at our, pub, our facilities' public spaces, as social distancing guidelines and practices should also apply to our healthcare settings. Communal workspaces, such as nurses' stations, are typically compact. We need to redesign those or to rearrange workstations to ensure that there is a distance of 1.2 meter between workstations, offices, and cubicles. Also, we need to look at break rooms, lounge areas, and cafeterias to maintain safe distancing and prevent overcrowding. Waiting area seats, rearrange them also to ensure that there is a 1.2 meter between each seat. And as was mandated by the Ministry of Health, screening stations need to be set up at all entrances. Hello? Yeah, yeah, it's clear, uh, Zina. Keep going. Okay, sure. And we need to set up respiratory triage areas and segregated waiting areas for suspected cases. 
Moving on to systems and structures, um, starting with communications. In the case of, because outbreaks and pandemics like the COVID-19 are fluid situations, they are not fully understood. We are dealing with the unknown. Information would change frequently and rapidly and to keep up with the flood of information and changing rules and guidelines can be overwhelming. Decide early on who will be communicating with your frontline staff. Decide on one person in specific time or times each day to make things more organized. Healthcare facilities need to check their visitation and companion policy and they need to identify what services to seize operation when they start scaling down. For example, cancellation of elective surgeries and non-urgent patients uh, visits, referring patients to the alternative care sites that we have mentioned before, and plan for satellite clinics and telehealth visits. Also, clinical engineering and facilities need to ensure that all vital and emergency equipment are in good working order. Alarms and alert systems need to be in place and functioning. Now we are moving on from the pre-search to the search situation. When we start having patients showing up to our facilities, it is when we want to redeploy staff from areas that we seized operations like the peri-op area to our critical care back of school. Most decide on which units this backup pool would be deployed to. Um, after training, you, are they going to work in COVID-19 areas or they're going to work with other patients? Are they going to support your ICU staff or high dependency units versus going to the regular floors? You need to make those decisions when the first patient starts to show, it, to show up at your facility. Also, because most facilities will not be able to dramatically increase their capacity with the same staffing design as they normally use, each facility will have to redesign their teams given the patient load and available back of care. This is, I will speak about different models in the upcoming slides. Starting with um, a model that was uh, recommended by the Society of, the Crit of Critical Care Medicine where they recommend a tiered staffing strategy for pandemic uh, pandemic situation where you have an ex a trained or experienced critical care physician oversees uh, four teams that are led by a non-ICU physician. And in each team, you'll have an IC four ICU nurses that each will be supervising uh, the care provided by three other non-ICU uh, nurses. So in this case, the critical care physician will be able to make critical care decisions and perform high level procedures on 96 patients, leaving the lower level decisions and the lower level, level procedures to be done by the non-ICU physicians and the non-ICU uh, team. This, uh, this tiered example is also supported by pharmacists, respiratory technicians, physiotherapists, et cetera, as needed. The other staffing model that uh, healthcare organizations can implement is team nursing, which uh, interestingly was developed during World War II to manage healthcare worker shortage. It works very well during times of crisis. Examples of that is a senior ED or a critical critical care nurse will lead a team of nurses to care for several critical care patients, typically between six to 10. Then to say this ED or critical care nurse will be responsible for supervising the care, ensure tasks are completed. And then another ED or a critical care nurse will be responsible for high risk tasks, such as vasoactive medication, management of arterial lines, and so forth. This will leave your acute care nurses from the peri-op or the high dependency unit responsible for other tasks such as administrating medications such as antibiotics, steroids, inserting IV lines, taking care of fully catheters and dressing. And you can utilize your ancillary staff and students and techs to perform 
uh, lower risk uh, tasks such as hygiene and repositioning. For, in order for team nursing, nursing to be effective, you need to explain the purpose of team nursing. You want to clearly explain the why behind moving to a team-based care. This is not about repurposing nurses to become ICU or emergency nurses. This is about utilizing the entire workforce to support each other, to optimize the skills of ICU nurses with other staff that can serve in various support roles. This is uh, an example of a team nursing that have been shared with me by a friend in the US and she has granted me permission to use this in my slide and so that's why I have the copyrighted material on the screen. Um, it, in the first example you can see a, an ICU nurse as a team leader paired with a non-ICU nurse, a patient care technician and a respiratory therapist and you have the task clearly delineated, so there is no room for confusion. You want to use your scopes of practices and job descriptions as a guide. You don't want to assign a task to someone that they are not licensed to do. You want to define those roles and responsibilities to the finest details, as you've seen in that example, to avoid confusion, to minimize conflict reduce the chance of miscare during this highly stressful time. You need to emphasize on communication, communication, and communication, and you would want to provide opportunity for redeployed staff to spend a few shifts shadowing in their host units so they get to know their new team members, get familiar with the geographical and functional layout of the host unit, which will help your deployed staff feel confident and reduce their anxiety. This is another example uh, from the same hospital that uh, pairs an ED nurse as a team leader with a non-ED nurse and a patient care technician caring for different levels of patients. And with each task also clearly mentions to avoid any confusions or conflict. Again, another example of pairing an ICU RN with a non-ICU RN. You can see the ICU nurse will be responsible for things like CRRT, chest tubes, vasoactive drips, while the non-ICU nurse will be responsible for things like Foley insertion, intake and output, feeding tube placement, et cetera. So you get the picture. After deciding on your shift, uh, on your Once you, once you decide on shifting model, on staffing model, the next step is to choose a shift plan. I have seen lots of reports that came from Wuhan, China, as they were the epicenter of the first coronavirus outbreaks. So what did they do in China is that they have built these massive cohorting hospitals that cared exclusively for COVID-19 patients. And they have deployed staff from different districts in China I think the number was around 50,000 doctors and nurses that were deployed to Wuhan. And the nurses worked four hour shifts in full PPE with no breaks and no PPE change and less visibly contaminated. You can imagine this would be a logistical nightmare that is not practical for a lot of healthcare settings outside of China, but it is an option that have shown to be really effective in minimizing the transmission of COVID-19 to nurses. Another recommendation that seemed, another consistent recommendation that I have seen over the past few weeks from professional organizations such as the Emergency Nurses Association, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, and the National Health Services in the UK, um, they is that shorter shifts of six to eight hours are preferable to 12 hour shifts it was noted that incidences of infection control breaches occurred less in the shorter shift and generally staff tend to loosen their guard after and let be less careful after six hours of constant donning and doffing. 
So as for the audience, what shift do you think is the most compatible with the current COVID-19 situation? 31% agreed with the Wuhan example, 40% agreed with the eight-hour shift, and 29% of participants think that 12-hour shifts are most compatible with COVID-19. Moving on. Another staffing model that was used uh, during the Ebola outbreak in 2014 was cycling teams, where staff are divided into two groups, an on-shift an on and an off-shift. The on-team is a group of physicians, nurses, allied health technicians that alternates every eight hours for two weeks. The off-team is an equal group of physicians, nurses, allied health technicians that stays home for two weeks and gets ready. Switching teams after two weeks have shown to have benefits. The risk of exposure is less. As the saying goes, not all your eggs are in one basket. Um, you can preserve staffing that way, especially during the early days of the pandemic, as things tend to quiet down before the actual surge happens. It offers a period of rest and recovery. If staff develop symptoms, they have the opportunity to re for recovery during the two weeks of them being on the off team without causing stress on the current staffing level. You might consider having supporting roles, uh, such as having a PPE officer uh, who makes sure that staff are donning and docking correctly. Going back to China again, one of the measures that have that this seems to be effective in reducing COVID-19 spread to nurses is that they had PPE monitors that observed staff donning and docking PPE and interfered immediately if they noticed any breaches. Um, another supporting role could be assigning someone to be a clean or dirty buddy to assist with tasks while wearing full PPE. Um, also, this is something that I personally feel needs to be in every within every team that is working in a public health emergency, such as a pandemic, having a safety wellness officer that ensures staff have taken their breaks, staff have access to food, water, bathroom breaks. They alternate staff when there's durations of prolonged PPE wear. If they notice somebody getting overwhelmed, angry, or emotional, they take them to a safe area to compress, to, to decompress, ventilate, especially during difficult or tense situations. Moving on to stuff, I will cope with surge and equipment. I will focus mostly on PPE because it's the most critical. This is a slide that I obtained from the Emergency Nurses Association COVID-19 micro learning sites, which is titled Preventing Unintentional PPE Loss During COVID-19 in Healthcare Facilities. So we need to track daily use and identify areas of high use, which is self-explanatory. The other two recommendations are to tailor conservatory strategies to care areas and to strategize distribution based on usage. So meaning you need to find a balance between staff being safe and avoiding wastage of resources. So if a unit like the emergency department or the ICU, they, they tend to generally have more aerosol generating procedures such as suctioning or intubating, while another area have less risk, you know, have a lesser risk area. Uh, they don't have aerosol generating uh, procedures or they don't have, they don't take care of COVID-19 patients. So, PPE that was assigned to that area could be redeployed to the higher risk area. Also, there's a wealth of resources online that, you, that can range from given instructions on increasing the use and longevity of PPE to some instructions on assembling do-it-yourself do PPE from household items. Since none of these are scientifically proven, I have referred back to the Saudi Center of Disease Control, which has a very good 
and useful guideline for healthcare providers regarding extending the use of N95 respirators. So according to the Saudi CDC, extending use of N95 re respirators refers to the practice of wearing the same N95 respirator for repeated healthcare activities with several patients without removing the respirator between patients' healthcare activities. And the extended use could be implemented when you have multiple patients who are infected with the same pathogen and patients are placed together in the same area, whether it's a waiting room or a hospital ward. The major, uh, if you look at the Saudi CDC website, they have a number of instructions. Zainab, sorry to, sorry to uh, interrupt you, but uh, okay. we would like to have uh, ten, uh, 10 minutes for the questions. We have a lot of questions. Okay. So if you can, and also there is, there is another request by the end of the lecture, if you can summarize uh, um, in, in Arabic, some of the speakers they asked to summarize in two minutes. I, I know it's not going to be easy to summarize one hour lecture in two minutes, but they, some of them, they, they have this, this, uh, this, this kind of, uh, of option. So we need to have a 10 minutes for the question. I, I sent the question to sure. your, to your uh, cell phone. It's a lot. It's really a lot of questions. So, so let's finish the lecture now, and then we'll move to the questions. So we'll continue with the... Yeah, but try to, to, to wrap it up so we can okay. have the time for the questions. Sure. Okay. So the major... We're, we were talking about N95 uh, respirators, so the major... Advice is to extended use is favored over reuse. Discard if N95 respirators were used during gen uh, aerosol generating procedures, and discard if they are visibly contaminated. Um, for strategies for optimizing PPE, like if you don't have PPE available. I, you guys can still hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we still okay, can. okay. So suddenly I saw my screen disappear. Okay, so for, for PPE, when it, for, when it comes to goggles, uh, if we have none or limited, limited supply, we want to conserve use of those for activities with anticipated splashes, sprays, prolonged face-to-face -face contact. And we can reuse and reprocess those by wiping the inside to the outside with disinfectant, and then wiping the outside with water or alcohol to remove residue. Um, for gowns, also, you want to prioritize their use during high contact patient care activities, such as dressing, bathing, and showering. So in short, you want to conserve your N95 respirators for aerosol generating procedures and think about using surgical masks for other types of low risk tasks. For goggles and gowns, also reserve those for anticipated splashes and high contact patient care activities and use alternatives after that. Okay, I'm glad to see that 73% have given, of institutions have given their staff clear guidelines regarding PPE extended use and reuse. Great. There are trends that different health system, systems have come up to tackle the shortage of PPE, like using ultraviolet light or hydrogen peroxide to, for the disinfection of uh, respirators. Um, a recent published study that came out a few days back that, that these methods have been effective, but they are dependent on the operator. And also they can, there's a risk for these procedures to warp the shape of the respirator so a full seal could be compromised. Moving on to space. You want to consider the use of the empty operating theater since you seized up, you canceled most of the non-urgent uh, surgeries. You might think of cohorting patients with the same pathogen or isolation. 
or coercing patients from the same household with the same gender and the same type of pathogen. You might consider use of the portable HIPAA filters for temporary, for temporary areas. Um, open and start operating from alternative care sites. And I want to emphasize on the next point, not only you need to ensure that staff have changing and showering facilities in the light of the recent new instructions by the health minister of Saudi Arabia, that healthcare workers should not wear scrubs or lab coats outside of a clinical setting. And to minimize the transmission risk, healthcare facilities need to invest in proper locker rooms and showering facilities for staff to use and designate clean and dirty areas in communal working stations, offices, and break rooms. And in systems, you need to act, decide on who will activate the search plan. You need to adjust your policies and procedures to accommodate the search. Again, communication, who and how. You need to think about your documentation. Uh, what is essential? What could we get rid of to make it easier for the nurses? Um, you need to think about shift reports, especially in the context of team nurses who will be doing the shift reports. These are all things that you need to think of as a system during the surge. And note about staff resilience. During the COVID-19 pandemic, nurses are experiencing intense pressure, fear, exhaustion, isolation, ongoing emotional trauma. This ongoing stress and ongoing trauma can impact the staff mental health safety and ability to provide the best care. Staff need to feel supported and cared for. Um, I put a note here for managers that coffees and donuts are nice, but they are not what staff want from you. Staff need to know that you are there to support them, that if they require something to do their job safely, you are going to act accordingly and try to resolve it. For example, if staff ask you for more PPE, you as a manager, Need to work with your chain of command and supply chain to get your staff the needed PPE. Um, you want to try to minimize external stressors as much as possible. And I say this with a heavy heart as, sim as a simple example came to my mind while talking about this. Um, just yesterday, I saw a number of tweets by nurses who were stressed beyond relief because their managers haven't issued them the new permits that allows them to travel to work during curfew hours. Staff don't need to worry that they're going to be cited or given a violation because their employer has failed to do their job responsibly. Be visible, be available. The next slide is a gentle reminder that to take care of yourself. It says emergency nurses, but I believe this can apply to anyone. Prioritize your daily self-care, ensure that you get daily exercise, eat healthy, nutritious meals, and get adequate hours of sleep. During work, you need to prioritize your own safety. Remember, there's no emergency in pandemic. If a patient collapses and requires recess, put on your PPE first. You need to prioritize taking regular breaks, lean on your work colleagues, and try to find humor and positivity in those difficult times. Take time for yourself on your time off to do something that you enjoy. People are different and they cope and heal in multitude of ways. Um, and we are, all, this is, this have been adapted from the ENA, the Emergency Nurses Association, the wellness. So we have survived the storm. Now what? It's time to go back to our previous way of doing things. For staffing, we need to return to previous model of staffing and scheduling. And please, managers, organize leaves and time off that, for leaves that were canceled or rescheduled. For stuff, we need to look at our usage and to procure new stock. Um, for spaces, we need to uh, establish a timeline for reopening the closed areas and to, for closing extensions and alternative care sites. We need to reschedule canceled surgeries, procedures, and appointments. We can expect there is going to be a backlog of all those that, of things that we didn't do because uh, of the COVID-19. Um, so precedence over a lot of other stuff. We need to reflect, review, and analyze the decisions that we're taking during search status, and we need to identify goals 
for potential surge plans since pandemics tend to have waxing and waning cycles. These are my references. So would you recommend this webinar to a friend, yes or no? Okay, Zain, are you done? I have one last slide and I will be done. Okay. So I will conclude my presentation with a quote from uh, American physicist, Professor Richard Fenman. The ultimate test of your knowledge is your capacity to convey it to another. And I hope I was able to convey the content of this webinar effectively and that you have found it to be beneficial. I want you to go back to your workplaces and start to be active in your emergency preparedness plans, regardless of your rank, of your work area, or your experience. Everyone can bring something to the table and we are in this together. I think you did. I think you 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 convey to other uh, uh, to others by if you see 95 95 percent of of the audience they believe they will uh, they will uh, recommend this uh, uh, this webinar to others. So That's good great. job. Thank you. Uh, I sent you uh, a lot of questions to your uh, to your to your cell phone, but uh, I don't think so. We're gonna answer. We will show some of those. So one of the question really. Uh, okay. One of the staff, she asked uh, how to protect myself. I'm a nurse, how to protect, it's written in Arabic, but I'm going to say it in English so everybody okay. can. Okay. How to protect myself uh, if I'm going to work. So what do you think? So, um, I didn't quite hear the question very well. Was Hello? Do, do you well, have... The question was, can you hear me now? Yes, better, yeah. Yeah, the question is, uh, uh, how I can protect myself as an staff nurse? I'm going to work. How, to, how can I can protect myself? Practice, put it on, of course, hand hygiene, practice donning and doffing of whatever available PPE that you have. If you are going to do an aerosol generating procedure, like suctioning or intubating or um, administering nebulizers, please use an N95 mask. If you don't have an N95 mask, use a surgical mask with um, a splash guard uh, to minimize the risk of transmission to, to yourself. Um, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene is the golden standard of prevention of infection. Okay, other question from from the audience asking mm -hmm. how we're gonna perform uh, uh, CPR to uh, an, uh, a patient and, uh, positive with the uh, with coronavirus. You need to put on PPE. So PPE with PPE before responding to CPR. Also, if um, we're Okay, uh, there is another question. Uh, 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 thank you, Zena, for the infor information. Is there a summarizing permit to clarify the priority of surge capacity in each institution? Do we have the questions written down somewhere so I can read them? Because the voice seems to... You cannot hear me? Because the, we, we have around 200 questions or 300 questions. I'm trying, okay. and some of them are not related, uh, not related to, the, to the topic. So I'm trying to, we're trying to get the question is related to the topic. So can you hear okay. me now? The sound keeps going back and forth, no. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We okay. can hear you very well. Okay. So uh, repeat the question one more time. I'll try to 
yeah, the, the, the question is, is there any specific pyramid how, uh, for the surge, how to de deal with the surge in, the, in their institution? A pyramid? Yeah. Okay, so staffing, staffing comes first. Is that, is that the question, is how to... I think they are, uh, 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 I'm, I'm not sure if they asking about uh, uh, the protocol. Is there an, a, a protocol, uh, a standard protocol, how to deal with the, uh, in, for, for the institution? No, each institution, to... each institution will apply their own surge capacity plan. Um, we can utilize, is, advice from professional organizations like the Society of Critical Care Medicine or the Emergency Nurses Association, but each will be tailored to an organization, um, organization needs, organizational, conventional capacity. These are all things that um, need to be considered before taking an advice from a professional society and applying it to a healthcare organization. I hope that answers the question. Yes, so, we we have an, uh, a question. Uh, one of the of the audience said, "Can can this presentation be sent to our email as an evidence of guidance to our hospitals?" I think some hospitals they don't have mm -hmm. a guidance or guidelines how to mm -hmm. deal with with the such. So, what do you think? Uh, have we recorded this? Uh, have we recorded this presentation or not? Yeah, we can. I think we can. Uh, if they leave the, uh, the, if they leave the email, the the, mm -hmm. the the one who asked this question, we can share with them. And we can we can, we can, we can, we can share it in the, in the in the our Twitter and the uh, SNA Twitter, and in the in the uh, uh, SNA website. Is, is it is it, uh, is it possible? Yeah, I think we can record. Even if it wasn't recorded in real time, we can record it in the future, and we can provide yes. it in our social media accounts. Yeah, why not? So how about in case of the surge and uh, with the no availability of single room, mm -hmm. is it okay to cohort the suspected cases ensuring 1.5 meters between bids? Um, this is a question that we have asked our Saudi CDC and they have, they have said yes. Um, granted that they have the same respiratory pathogen and they don't have any other um, isolation precautions. For example, you cannot put two, you cannot put a COVID-19 patient with another COVID-19 patient who has MRSA or ESBL, for example. But you can cohort uh, a number of patients with the same respiratory pathogens if you don't have enough isolation rooms. So uh, we have an, a lot of questions regarding the training. So how we can train people? I think this is what the, the uh, most other uh, other audience talking about. How, who can make sure that our hospital doing a training uh, for the surge plan? So first of all, people need to come together and assess what they need before they start training. Okay. And based on those needs that come up, if, on those deficiencies that come up during the, those assessments, you need to tackle each you know, deficiency um, and start putting plans for each component. For example, if it's for training, um, you need to look at the skills that uh, are available at, for example, if we're trying to train nurses who don't work in the ICU by nurses who, do, who work in the ICU, we want to look at the skills that we want them to do and we focus on those. So you really need to do assessment planning before you, you move on to your training uh, programs. Um, there are a lot of resources online. Um, the uh, Saudi uh, by the way, the, the lecture will be, yeah, sorry, Zainab, the lecture will yeah. be recorded and will be in, uh, uh, again, uh, the lecture will be in the Saudi Commission website. So okay, everybody that's great. It's recorded. And it's mm -hmm. going to be available. That, that I think we're going to take two more questions. But I have okay. uh, who sets the standard for surge capacity building, uh, Zina? 
It should be your emergency preparedness team in your hospital. Each hospital should, or health institution, each health institution have their own emergency preparedness plan team or coordinators, and they are the ones who will assess um, our current capacity and they will recommend um, interventions to help increase our surge capacity. Okay. It could be, it doesn't have to be doctors or nurses, it could be anybody who's working in the hospital. Okay, I, I think we, we go through most of the questions. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to say thank you, uh, Zainab. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will uh, we will have you soon in uh, in, in the next uh, uh, webinar. Again, I'd like to thank you the uh, the team from the Saudi Commission. Maybe I forget some of their names, but uh, they really did a great job. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully our audience they get the benefits from our, uh, our webinar today. Please keep in touch with the SNA through the Twitter, through the website, share with us uh, your thought. This, uh, uh, this association for every nurses, not only for the Saudi nurses, but it's for the Saudi and non-Saudi. We have a lot of, we are not one year old yet. So uh, we, we will have a lot of plans. We're supposed to have a, a big conference in this month, but because what happened, we uh, uh, we postpone it to uh, uh, next year, hopefully. And please share with us. We would like to hear from uh, uh, from you mm -hmm. uh, again. Uh, uh, the Nessig Saudi Association. This is under the the, the Saudi uh, the Saudi Commission. Thank you for everybody, and I hope to see you soon. Assalamu alaikum, shukran jazeera. Thank you.